Hello and welcome back. In this module we discuss the role, function and position of music in contemporary society. And today I will interview Anahit Kasabian, a scholar who has thought and written extensively about this topic. In particular, Anahit studies sound and music in contexts where they are not the prime focus of attention. She is the author of Ubiquitous Listening and Hearing Film. And her current research focuses on sound and music in everyday digital culture, such as YouTube videos, smartphone app games and web series. Welcome, Anahit. Thank you very much. In um, Ubiquitous Musics, a book that you've co-edited with uh, Marcia Garcia Quinones and Elena Bocci, you write about a fictive person who, heard, um, who heads to a department store to buy a present for a friend. And of course there's background music uh, playing in such stores. Well now I always thought that this music is there to create a certain atmosphere, an atmosphere of consumerism uh, that activates that you want to buy something. But you write that there might be several other reasons uh, why this music is played in those stores. So I'm very curious to hear about these other reasons. Um, you're, you're right, absolutely, that it creates a kind of general atmosphere and there's a kind of um, idea of relaxing consumers and those kinds of things. But in addition, there's a number of things. Um, stores can attempt to moderate the tempo of your walking speed or give you an idea of being in another country or even just remind you where you are. And those kinds of things might seem unimportant, but the tempo of your walking speed changes purchasing patterns because if you're walking more slowly, you look around and you notice things and you pick up things that maybe weren't on your shopping list, right? And so you, you buy more if you're walking more slowly. Um, similarly, if you are thinking about France or imagining being in France, you buy more French products. So if a store has a, a particular focus on a certain line of product, they can help you help you uh, decide to buy those products by the music that they play. Or they can um, participate in uh, what has come to be called sonic branding, which is giving themselves an identity through uh, sound and music choices. Um, and that's only stores. If we think about restaurants, for instance, restaurants can try to moderate how quickly you eat because um, cheaper restaurants want a quick turnover of tables in order to make more money, whereas expensive restaurants want you to go slowly and stay so that you buy more extras, another bottle of wine, maybe a, a dessert or a cheese board or something. And so they, they make your pace by musical choices. Um, and, and there's all kinds of things like that. I mean, those are some, just a few examples. So, Yeah, it's uh, coming back to the sonic branding and, and also to, to, to everything else that you just answered. Um, what, what becomes clear here is that, that, um, that you are affected by music, but it's not through attentive listening. Uh, we hear music all day in various contexts, but it mostly goes unnoticed. Uh, so, th so this attentive listening is absolutely not a necessary requirement to be affected uh, by music. Yeah. Um, so it, it's more like music engages you in a, in a more sensual, sensory effective process. Um, could you say something more about those musical experiences which, as you say, are happening or taking place between consciousness on one side and the subconscious or unconscious on the other side? Absolutely. Um, I, as you know, this is sort of the area that I'm interested in, uh, the sort of what what is between consciousness and unconsciousness in, in terms of musical activity. Um, so the, the example that I always think of is if you imagine that you're in a, a pub or a bar and there's music playing and you're sitting around talking to friends and you're chatting and not particularly paying attention to the music and then all of a sudden you notice the song. So something has happened in that moment from not paying attention to paying attention. 
And there's lots of different reasons that could be. Sometimes it's because the conversation gets quiet and so the music has a higher profile in the auditory uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, yeah, spectrum of the, of the setting. Uh, but often it's because there's some particular thing that you notice. And that can be so, something from an, an instrument or a particular passage. Or, and and those, those moments have to do, I think, a lot with memory. But, but they're also, you experience them sensorily. Right. So um, the way scientists know what's happening is by measuring heart rate or blood pressure or skin conductivity. But, you know, in in the arts and humanities, we can think about these questions in other ways. So we can think about, for instance, memory. Right. And think about um, how uh, memory attaches to musical events and therefore can bring things into consciousness because there's something important attached to that musical passage, right? People often talk about using music as a way to remember times of their lives or particular relationships or particular events. That's that kind of thing. And the other uh, big category, in addition to, to memory, that we, that we know about, I mean, everybody, not just researchers, is about music managing mood, right? So uh, we, you know, we talk about using music like that all the time, that if we, if we need to relax, we put on a certain kind of music. If we need to get pumped up for a workout, we put on a certain kind of music. There's all kinds of things like that. And in fact, increasingly, there are businesses that will provide you with playlists for kinds of activities. Um, but but we do it ourselves too, and we we create playlists for uh, for moods, right? And we and we be, have become fairly um, sophisticated at using music to tune our moods or to to do that memory work. Um, and I think those are very very much. Um, taking place between unconsciousness and consciousness. It's, it's kind of like it's in the background of your mind as well as in the background of the auditory profile of the environment. Yeah. <clears throat> if you go back <clears throat> sorry, to these uh, companies that are providing uh, background music or so-called background music um, to, to, to shops and stores and enterprises, etc., and, and thus uh, influencing, or perhaps you could even say manipulating the mood of the customers or clients or passers-by. Do you think that is ethically justifiable to do such a thing? I mean, is this the way we can, we can deal with music and, and deal with people? I think it's a very complicated question. Um, on the one hand, it's a commonplace and has been, at the very least, since the early 20th century and the invention of music, but certainly salon music, court music. I mean, there's a long history of using music in, as some kind of background. Um, so is it possible to think of something that ordinary as unethical? I think we find that difficult. On the other hand, if we stop to imagine, for instance, Suppose I'm a shopper on a very uh, tight budget and because of some music practice in a store, I spend more money than I should. Is that ethical? Surely that's got to qualify as unethical, I think. So I, I actually tend towards the unethical and I, and I have thought a lot about it and I I held back from saying it in print because I think it's a it's a very difficult question, but I think it's an important one, and I think it's something that that we may, perhaps we each have to to decide for ourselves. But I think it's something that that really bears thinking about. So, so I'm glad I came, I'm glad you thought to ask it. Well, it's something that we will address the, the relation between music and ethics in uh, another part of this course. So we will come back for sure to that. You were talking about uh, how how music uh, was already having a 
kind of manipulative function in in courts in so in, in it's actually something from from ancient times um, now you also in your book you also uh, uh, write a lot about about uh, current developments in how people are dealing with music. Uh, well, maybe the most important one: people wearing headphones, uh, using iPods, so that you have a personal choice. Uh, you, you also talked uh, previously about uh, people creating their own playlists. Now, if if you relate that to um, to the use of background music or or sonic wallpaper, sometimes uh, as, it, uh, as it's called, sometimes in in stores. Uh, how do you see the development in, 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 this, uh, in, in this way of using music when, when people are just having their own playlists? So what will be the role of this uh, background music or this, this muzak or the music played in stores and, 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 and restaurants or whatever else? Uh? It's a great question. Um, I think there's... Uh, several different things that we have to think about. One is the settings in which we we feel comfortable using headphones. So certainly, I imagine many, if not most of the students in the course will be used to wearing headphones during transit, right? Whether we're walking or biking or on a bus, many, many, many people use headphones in those settings. Um, and those are not generally settings where there's music. However, people also use leave, leave headphones on in stores. And there, it's like a little act of resistance, right? That they are listening to their own playlist rather than what the store wants. On what is maybe now the third hand. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the, the industry of building playlists for specific kinds of activities somehow is a third term in this setting, right? If there's what the store wants and what you want, if some, if there's a, if there's an ent a business entity selling you playlists, then they can look for support from businesses because they, they do a good job of selling playlists that are in the interest of the businesses, but they also have to convince consumers that, they're, that their playlists are useful and pleasurable and whatever. So I think that industry will be a big growth industry in the next 20 years or so. The, the, for the further future, the, the question will be listening technologies. And by that, I mean, I saw a video recently where a guy had a, a, a bank chip put into his hand so that he didn't have to carry a card. He paid by by putting his hand on the machine. Um, and you know, there's lots of sci-fi literature that talks about those kinds of uh, literature and film that talks about having those kinds of implants. If that really is a direction that we go, then there'll be music available in that way and that may put pressure on um businesses to turn music off altogether because they'll they'll be conflicting music available at the same time on the fourth hand however um there's also all kinds of um uh you'll know this there's there's technologies that make uh sound and music very place specific so that you can walk from one step hearing nothing and the next step into hearing sound or music or something. And so I think that kind of locative music um, will also have a, a role in the, in the future in, in business context. So there's a lot to, to be, to see and be developed. Um, well, I come to my final question, which is maybe also to do with, quite recent developments in, in music and sound. Uh, your, your current work focuses on, on music and sound in, in, in app games such as uh, Candy Crush and Angry Birds. And could you tell us something about the role that music plays as well as the other sounds in these, what you call time killer games? Yeah, 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 very. Um, and it's a huge industry. I mean, it's very, very big. Um, 
so the, it's it's interesting. I mean, most of the games, as as your uh, students will know, most of the games have very uninteresting music. There, it's very lo-fi. It's it has the sound of eight-bit music, even if it isn't. Um, uh, and they run on relatively small loops. And so I think many people um, turn the music off. However, what the music suggests, if you, if you listen to it, is a kind of leisure, pleasure, fun, uncomplicated sort of scene. And I think for a, a, a certain generation, that sounds like their childhood. It, do, it doesn't to me, but for some people, it will sound like childhood. Um, but I don't think the music is the most interesting part of the games. Um, if you can imagine a, a kind of prehistory when uh, keyboards were first being developed for personal computers, um, you know, the, the, the silent keyboard, very quickly it became obvious that the silent keyboard was going to be a failure. And the reason was that people like having a little bit of auditory feedback. Not a lot, but a little. There's a similar story about um, Ford trucks and Toyota trucks, that Ford trucks at one point were quieter than Toyota trucks. So even though they were more powerful, the Toyota trucks were selling better and Ford had to back engineer sound, sound into their trucks. Um, similarly with keyboards, they had to go back and re-engineer sound in for people to be, to be comfortable. And I think that's what sound does in these games. It provides a kind of reward. You, so you know you actually accomplished this, getting rid of this row of candy or getting rid of this structure uh, made that's hiding the pigs, right? Whatever, whatever it is, you, you, you get a little bling or something that tells you that you succeeded. And that sort of, those rewards, those auditory rewards keep people going. And they are, a, 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 I mean, I would argue that they're one of the big pleasures because, you know, the event that you see is, is much less of an event. But, but the difference between when you're playing and when you succeed is from zero to, to one in, in auditory feedback, whereas the visual is sort of just more of the same. So I think the, the sound rewards are um, quite significant in keeping you playing and keeping you going with those games. So Dubs once more to, to the um, omnipresence of sound and music in our environment. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the, the register below consciousness, right? That it's, you're not quite aware, but you're not unaware either. So. Well, Anahid, thanks a lot for this wonderful interview. And Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about my research. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.